Senator Rand Paul says he's a different kind of Republican. And at the Fox News debate, he aired those differences with Donald Trump and New Jersey Governor Chris Christie. How's that working out for him? Senator Paul joins us now. Senator, we talked on the O'Reilly factor on Friday, and you acknowledge that one of the reasons that you were so combative in that debate is because you are lagging a bit in the polls. I know it's only been a couple of days since then, but has it paid off? You know, our numbers of contributors have gone up dramatically. We have well over 100,000 contributors. 96% uh, of our contributors give under $100. So, yeah, we think we've excited our base. And one of the things that really shows is that when you poll me head-to-head -head with Clinton, I actually lead her in five states won by President Obama. It's interesting to contrast that with Donald Trump, who actually is 16 points behind Clinton. So my suggestion is next time we do a debate, maybe that ought to be a poll we ought to look at in uh, calculating who we talk to. All right. You brought up Trump. Let's talk about him because you had a kind of quick exchange with him right off the bat uh, when he refused to pledge uh, that he would support the eventual Republican nominee. You came in cold. Here it is. Okay. This is what's wrong. He buys and sells politicians of all stripes. He's already, hey, look, look, he's already hedging his bet on the Clintons, okay? I want to go past that moment and ask you big picture. Senator, what do you think of Donald Trump? Well, I don't think we should reward vulgarity, and I don't think vulgarity equates with insight. And so because you can shout and call people names and call someone stupid or call someone fat, is that really what we're going to make the decision on for who's going to be our nominee? You know, I came out of the Tea Party movement, and part of the Tea Party movement was that we were upset with fake conservatives and Republicans who truly weren't conservative, Republicans who were for Obamacare and Republicans who were for the bank bailouts. Well, that's, that's Donald Trump. He's been for all of these liberal policies, and now because he can stand up and say vulgar things and he's a truth teller, well, the truth is, what is he for? I have no idea whether he's conservative. He really could be a liberal for all I'm concerned. I have no idea what his real philosophy is other than that he is for promoting himself. Then there was that heated exchange with Governor Chris Christie about government surveillance. Here's a taste of that. Listen, Senator, you know, when you're sitting in a subcommittee just blowing hot air about this, you can say things like that. I don't trust President Obama with our records. I know you gave him a big hug, and if you want to give him a big hug again, go right ahead. Senator, I, I want to delve down a little bit into this issue. You say that you want to collect records about the terrorists, not about innocent Americans, but law enforcement Experts say that that is naive. They say you can't connect the dots to find somebody unless you have the dots. Well, you know, the truth of the matter is every time we've been attacked here on the homeland, we have had evidence in advance. We had evidence in advance on the Boston bomber. The Russians tipped us off. We also should have known he went back to Chechnya, and we didn't do a good job knowing his whereabouts. The Garland shooter recently, the one who traveled from Arizona, we had evidence in advance. Major Hassan, the mass murderer at Fort Hood, we had evidence for years that he was radicalized and had radical notions of radical Islam. And at political correctness, just kept, we kept advancing him in the military because people were afraid to stand up and say enough's enough. So no, I don't think there's any instance in which we found that the indiscriminate bulk collection of records have helped us. Three independent commissions looked at this. Every one of them said that no terrorist has been caught through the bulk collection. So I actually do want more individualized uh, investigation. The Fourth Amendment says you can collect records. You just have to name the target, have some suspicion, not even proof, but suspicion that you present to a judge and a judge's signature. But I don't want the blanket surveillance of all Americans. I'm not willing to give up on the Bill of Rights in order to say, oh, I can feel more safe. We've been doing this and actually we've been attacked despite the collection of all these bulk records. But, but you know, there are a lot of, I think you would say, respected people. Maybe you wouldn't say they're respected. Uh, General Michael Hayden, former head of the CIA, Dianne Feinstein, uh, the ranking Democrat, former chairman of Senate Intelligence, that says that this bulk collection has worked has protected us. I mean, let me give you a specific example. If, and this is the one that law enforcement officials say, if we suddenly discover a terrorist phone number that's being used, let's say, out of Pakistan, and we want to go back and find out who that person has been talking to, if we haven't been collecting the records, how do we go back and trace 
who that terrorist on that cell phone number has been calling over the last six months. Well, what you're describing is actually an instance in which we do have specific information and we would write that down and we would say we have suspicion and I would sign the warrant for that. And then you get the information. But, but the wait, 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 sir, but, I, but the point the is, the point is but, wait, wait, but the point is, if we haven't been collecting the records along the whole time, when we discover today that there's a bad guy out there using a phone call, how do we f trace who we called six months ago? The records are kept by the phone company and typically are kept for 18 months or more. There's no evidence that any of this has worked is the most important thing to understand. We've been doing this for 10 years. Not one terrorist has been caught through this program. But the thing is, is when you look and you say, is it illegal? The courts have said it's illegal. Many scholars are saying it's unconstitutional. And I believe it to be unconstitutional. And the thing is, is I know so many young men and women who have sacrificed parts of their body, died in battle or lost limbs in battle. And I think it's a disservice to them to say, oh, well, we're just going to give up on the Bill of Rights while you're gone. The young men I talk to, the young women I talk to who have fought, they say they fought for the Constitution. They fought for the Bill of Rights. And I, I think it's disappointing that our, we would give up on that, these protections. This is the freedom. When we say we're fighting for freedom, it's the freedom from government surveillance. And so I think it's a mistake to give up on this, but it's also a mistake to believe that it's actually working. There's no evidence that it has worked at all. All right. I think we need more directed surveillance and more of it. Uh, Senator, you say that the one thing you wish you had gotten to talk about in the debate is your tax plan. So I'm now, in the moments remaining, going to give you an opportunity to do that. You favor a flat tax of 14.5% on personal income and a 14.5% European-style VAT, or value-added tax, which many conservatives oppose as a hidden sales tax. According to the Tax Foundation, a group that you often cite, the revenue that you're going to get from your tax plan, sir, uh, it would be three trillion, a loss of $3 trillion in revenue over a decade. How are you going to make that up? <laughs> uh, it depends on how you look at it, Chris. I look at it as a $3 trillion gain for the taxpayer, and that's the debate we ought to have. We ought to have a debate whether you want government to be bigger or smaller, and whether you want the private sector to be bigger or smaller. I want the private sector to be $3 trillion bigger. That's how jobs are created. Government doesn't create jobs. And this is a real debate we ought to have in our party. But, but let me want tax sir, cuts if I may, or do we if want I may to get, keep government the same size? Let me get size. specific about that. Because 80% of the money that this government spends is on entitlements and interest serving the debt, servicing the debt. So either, critics would say, you're either going to have to make substantial cuts to Medicare and Medicaid, or that's the 80%, or you're going to have to gut that other 20%, which is everything from defense spending to homeland security to all our social programs. I mean, how do you, it's easy to say shrink the government, but when you've got 80% that's entitlements, what do you do? We have to look at everything across the board, and all of government needs to be smaller. And I have put forward a plan. I put th forward three five-year plans that balance the budget over five years, including significant tax cuts. But I believe in a much smaller government, and that's what we have to have this debate about. If you want a Republican that's going to keep government the same size by having revenue neutral tax reform and not really cutting taxes, I'm not the guy. I want to dramatically lower rates like Reagan did. But the Tax Foundation also said that my plan would create millions of jobs and that mine's the most pro-growth tax plan ever presented. But I go one step further, too, because when the Democrats say, oh, will this help the rich? I'm going to say it also helps the poor and the working class because my tax plan gets rid of the payroll tax. Social Security will pay paid for by the businesses, not by the individual any longer. So a guy or a woman making $40,000 a year will get $2,000 more in their check every year. I think this will be wildly popular. Okay, we'll so have a debate. Senator, do you want I, government I, I, to be I, I smaller want to or do you want the private sector to be bigger? Excuse me. I, I don't mean to interrupt. i got one minute left, and I want to ask you one other question because it's exactly on this point of fairness. Again, talking about the tax foundation and what they say, uh, under your plan, a family making from fifty to $75,000 a year would get a 3% rise in income. Sounds pretty good, but a family making more than a million dollars a year would get a 13% rise in income. Question, doesn't your plan massively increase income inequality? 
Well, the thing is, is income inequality is due to some people working harder and selling more things. So if people voluntarily buy more of your stuff, you'll have more money. And it's a fallacious notion to say, oh, well, rich people get a, more money back in a tax cut. If, 10, if you cut taxes 10%, 10% of a million is more than 10% of $1,000. So obviously people who paid more in taxes will get more back. But we all end up working for people who are more successful than us. And that's a good thing, that more money will be back in the economy. But let's have that debate. Do we want more money in Washington or more money in the economy? I think if we send more money back to the economy in a dramatic fashion and really are for tax cuts, this has been my problem with Republicans. So many Republicans in Washington aren't really for tax cuts anymore. I'm for a dramatic tax Senator. cut, more dramatic than any tax cut since Ronald Reagan, and I think that'd be good for the economy. Senator Paul, it is an interesting debate. I want to continue with you. Thank you. Thanks for sharing part of your Sunday with us. Always good to talk with you, sir. Thanks, Chris. Up next, our Sunday.